Namaste and greetings. I, Mahima Kapoor, researcher and assistant editor at IMTRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav, Evam Niti and Sandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, welcome you all to the IMTRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a panel discussion on Manregs amidst the pandemic, impact and the way forward. As part of the series, the state of employment and livelihoods, hashtag employment debate. This deliberation is being organized by the EP Center for Work and Welfare, Indian Social Institute and Counterview. I feel privileged to introduce the chair for the session, Father Dr. Denzel Fernandez. Sir is the executive director at Indian Social Institute, New Delhi. Welcome, sir. I am honored to introduce the eminent panel for today. Professor Aruna Roy is the president, National Federation of Indian Women and founder, Mazdoor Kisan Shakti Sangathan. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gurjeet Singh is the state coordinator, social audit unit, Charkhand, and former consultant, Ministry of Rural Development, Government of India. Welcome, sir. Mr. Sandeep Chatra is the Executive Director, ActionAid India. Welcome, sir. Yeah. Professor Urudaya Rajan is the Founder, Chairman, the International Institute of Migration and Development, Thiruvanthanam Puram. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And Professor R.V. Bhagat is the Professor and Head, Department of Migration and Urban Studies, International Institute for Population Sciences, Mumbai. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I invite Dr. Fernandez to take the proceedings further, and we look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mahima Chi, for your introduction. And uh, good evening and warm welcome to this uh, uh, panel discussion on Mandrega amidst the pandemic, impact and way forward, uh, organized by uh, Impact and Policy Research Institute, IMPRI, um, and uh, Indian Social Institute count and Counterview. Uh, it has been nearly two years now since we are uh, experiencing this uh, pandemic. And uh, we have witnessed uh, many changes that have taken place. And one of the important uh, policy measures that the government of India had undertaken uh, 15 years ago has been uh, the Rural Employment Guarantee Act, uh, Manrega, which is uh, one of the largest, <clears throat> in fact, the largest employment guarantee act in the world it has been able to generate employment in rural areas uh, for uh, crores of uh, households. And uh, in the last uh, few years, especially uh, after this NDA government started, uh, there was a feeling that um, uh, there's less allocation for Manrega. <clears throat> Manrega allocation was uh, declining and uh, there was also uh, various problems with the implementation of uh, Manrega. But uh, after the pandemic, the pandemic uh, resulted in a huge increase in demand for work. And uh, the government was forced to increase allocation. So one of the things that has happened in the last uh, couple of years has been a huge increase in uh, allocation for Mandrega. Uh, last year, the uh, government increased uh, the allocation by 40,000 crores. And this time, uh, it has again run out of money for Manrega as the 
demand for jobs has increased. And uh, so uh, again, uh, another 25,000 crores has been sanctioned over and above what has already been uh, allocated. So uh, nearly, uh, nearly one lakh crores of rupees has been uh, allocated for Mandreka when it was before the pandemic, it was just around 50, uh, 50 60,000 crores. Um, so this shows that uh, this Employment Guarantee Act, which was visualized uh, 15 years ago, has had its impact. And especially in times of pandemic, uh, where there has been tremendous rural distress and a lot of uh, migrant workers from urban centers returning back to rural areas, it has increased uh, the pressure on jobs. Uh, and a lot of people, including graduates, have uh, applied for Manrega jobs during the uh, pandemic times. Uh, so now we are, uh, we have come here, we have uh, eminent panelists uh, over here to uh, discuss or to reflect on the impact of uh, Manrega uh, during the pandemic, how it has functioned uh, and uh, what needs to be done in the future, or what, uh, what improvements or what policy changes need to be taken given our experience of the pandemic uh, from the point of view of policymakers and from the point of view of uh, uh, civil society, what we can do and uh, you know, uh, how academics can uh, help in this matter. Uh, so we have uh, an eminent panel of uh, uh, Aruna Roy, who um, is one of the, uh, you can say, could be uh, one of the architects, you can say, of uh, Manrega. And uh, Dr. Gurjeet Singh, uh, Sandeep Chachra of Action Aid, Prof. Idura Rajan, uh, and, uh, uh, who has written extensively, and Prof. R.B. Bhagat, uh, from IFPS, uh, we have an eminent panel to uh, speak on on this topic. And uh, now, I, without uh, without spending much more time in in this introductory remarks, I move on to um, Aruna Royji to uh, to speak on speak on, uh, speak on uh, the, the pandemic. I hope you can hear me. Yes. 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 You, have, you have to uh, mute uh, the speaker of the other device. No, no, that's been closed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Please go ahead. It, just it took me happens. a minute because they overlap for a minute. Yes. Please go ahead. I want to thank you all very much for inviting me to present my views on this very exceptional panel. I'll just take my 10 minutes, but I'm going to run through my 10 minutes because uh, there's so much to say. And I'll be more like a news bulletin with, with, uh, with bullet points, I'm afraid. The first thing I'd like to remind all of us is that when the new government took over, one of the first statements made by the eminent prime minister in the Lok Sabha was to draw attention to the two prospective failures of the UPA, of the RTI and the NREGA, and they say had, had a statement that he'll retain them only as monumental failures to show how inefficient the previous government was. In an interview with me and with a few other people, Dr. Pai, who was their advisor later, argued that the NDNRGA was the reason for India's economic failure and the RTI was for its inefficiency in policy. The paralysis in policy was because of RTI and the NDNRGA was in fact the reason for India's downward slide in the economy. They have come a long way because if it weren't for the NRGA, I'm afraid the Indian government would have been extremely embarrassed during the pandemic with enormous numbers of starvation deaths and unemployed people, riots, and anything that you can imagine in the nature of millions of people who were homeless, jobless, or en route. So I'll quickly run through some figures and say that the NGNREGA 
needs to be nurtured. It, there are many things that are going wrong with it, partly because of bureaucratic inefficiency, partly because of lack of political intent and lack, and also many lies that are said about A, the workforce, the, the, the employment, and also in terms of finances, and I'll come down to it very, very quickly. So I have about eight minutes left and I'll run through my eight minutes. We all know that according to the inequality virus India supplement re released by Oxfam, that India's 100 billionaires raised their fortunes by 12,97,822 crores. I can't even imagine that amount of money. And they say that if every one of the 138 million poorest Indian people were paid a check of 94,045 each, that money would be spent. They also say that an unskilled worker would take 10,000 years to make what Mukesh Ambani made in an hour during the pandemic, and three years to make what he made in a second. Now, this is the kind of capital we have massed, or massed up during the pandemic. And it is actually an absolutely uh, biased policy and a desire not to benefit the poor, but to make the rich richer that has really hit the, 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 the workers and the people who are at the cutting edge. Now, when this people went back on migration, the only thing that saved them in their rural homes was the NDNREG. And many people enlisted for work who were, as was mentioned by Dr. Daniel Denzel Fernandez, people who were graduates, people who had white collar jobs or blue collar jobs had gone back to work who couldn't have existed without this program. I could run through the figures basically, but there have been increase in numbers of figures because of the pressure for employment. As we all know, the NGNRG doesn't really depend on a budget. It can't depend on a budget. It is a worker driven program. So when you ask for employment, you have to be given that employment under the act. There can be really no budget allocation, which is rigid. You can make an allocation with expandable boundaries, but that no government has actually done so far. And we have to fight to say that it's a demand-driven program. And in a demand-driven program, the financial outlay cannot be decided. You can have an estimate done because after all, governments have to work with their estimates, but actually the financial outlay will have to be decided by the nature of the country's economy by the drought and famine situation that prevails, by catastrophes and disasters that have happened, and, and many other things that happen to increase cross counter migration, but also poverty in the villages. We have an estimate that 67 lakh migrants re returned home during the COVID period, and 35 new lakh new job cards have been issued. But let's look at some of the figures that have been said, uh, told us, which we cannot take at face value. We know that NGNRGA data shows that 13.25% of households who demanded work under the scheme were not provided work. And 35.25% of households is a large number. This further breaks the government's claim that states are creating demand for work. They've been accusing all kinds of, especially the opposition states of false figures of demand for work, but it's not true. What are the issues we are facing? The total budget allocation, budget allocation for engineer NREG for the current financial year was 34% less than the revised budget of 2021 financial year because back payments had to be made. There were many pay places where employment wages had not been paid. If you deduct that from the, way, the allocation that they made, it's a paltry sum. As of September 21, the government had already spent 90% of its NGNREG budget. And many states have no money to pay workers their wages. It is true that there are lots of pending wages in many states. And they also introduced the caste-based fund transfer orders, which has been very detrimental. This produced some terrible effects on the ground. So the actually, what do we need? You want me to speak about the future program in a later time, but I'm going to add it here because I don't know what I can do in two minutes. It's very difficult to say. Yeah. So I'm going to give some of the suggestions now and at those two minutes, I'll talk about my political position on the MDNREG. We have to ask that, we have to say that cash transfers can expand the employment guarantee scheme, but payment of 
part of it with wages should be in subsidized food. We cannot have just cash transfer for any kind of NGN or EGA work because we've been resisting it. Then existing, so in, in the case of a cash transfer, we do not want a dole, we want payment of part of the wages and payment part of the wages in kind. The food for work program can come in, but we cannot have a transfer just in the bank accounts. We don't want a dole. The existing entitlements, all of them need to be taken seriously. We have 10 of them. Work must be guaranteed on demand. And this is a very important guarantee because it affects every individual family very, very hard. We must be also must use the MGNRG budget to pay full wages to all active job, job card holders during the lock to any further lockdown, future lockdown, if we get one. I don't know if we will, I hope not, but if we do. The act makes a provision for unemployment allowance and the state cannot provide work. And there has been very, very desultory payment of any kind of unemployment allowance, work not supplied time. The government has existing provisions for expanding MD and RG work by another 50 days in situations of any calamity. The expansion of the Employment Guarantee Act must therefore be effective and open-ended. The 100 days per family must expand to allow access to any adult seeking any number of days of work during the period of recovery from COVID. If it should happen, and even now, there are extremely dire cases of people who are on the cutting edge of poverty. We should ask for an unemployment, urban unemployment guarantee, which should be put in place in the urban areas. As industry revamps and struggles to restart, many casual and even regular workers in various industries will need fallback employment. Apart from the regular public works, we must ask for home-based activities to be permitted, provided the work from home, is for selected services. And we should have a big debate on what these selected services may be. And production activities such as making masks, soaps, sanitizers will help the challenge of any future COVID. But we can look for other things as well. We in Rajasthan are arguing that people who have a proficient in various kinds of arts should also be used as teachers in middle schools, perhaps, to teach that art or skill we have a huge heritage of musicians. We want musicians to become music teachers and they be treated as wage workers. To fund the Maharashtra Employment Guarantee Scheme, as it was called, a, a very important self-sustaining system was built on which the NGNREG is actually based. There was a professional tax on all salary earners, a tax on petrol, a sales tax, takes, sales tax surcharge, and a tax on the income group of three crop irrigated farms to be put into a dedicated employment guarantee fund. As a consequence, Maharashtra always had enough money to implement the law. As and when the economy recovers, of course, there will be fewer demands, but at the moment we need it. We need to look at innovative funding patterns for the NGNREG, a 2% of the uh, two to 5% of the money that has been earned by multinational companies and Indian national companies which work in India should be given for disaster management employment guarantee program, which should cover our costs. In effect, we need to think creatively about a future for the NREGA while fighting very hard for making its present structure more vigorous and alive. We have to ask for social audits to be performed in all the MGNRGA work sites and to find out where that actually the money went and why money was not paid in time. I'm going to end here because I think people who know as much as I do are on the panel, maybe they know more because of recent research. But I must say that politically for us today, the MGNRG has been a vital survival mechanism for the hundreds of thousands of people who are on the cutting edge. I see every day, I'm speaking from a village in Rajasthan, and I see every day hundreds of women going to the work site because without that, they wouldn't be able to eke out their livelihood. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Aruna Royalty, for your, um, for your presentation. You have uh, given uh, uh, the, the situation of uh, MGNREGA and uh, given several suggestions. 
some of that is uh, you have uh, Aruna Royji has uh, uh, has advocated for part cash, part kind, uh, and uh, of course the other um, aspects has been work uh, must be granted on demand, full wages during lockdown and unemployment allowance, which is already built in into MG and REGA. Uh, then uh, 100 days being expanded, uh, unemployment uh, uh, guarantee, for other different types of work like home-based home work also uh, included and uh, innovative funding pattern uh, to fund, uh, to fund uh, MG and REGA as well as uh, social audits. So, uh, so here are some takeaways from uh, what uh, uh, Aruna Roy presented. Uh, now I move May on. I just, excuse me, may I just say one thing? I did not suggest that there should be half cash and half in kind, only if they insist on cash transfer. If they okay. insist on cash transfer, I don't think we want cash transfer. But if they insist on cash transfer, then we would, should say that we do not want cash transfer. If we want, if they ca transfer cash, we want half in kind. We don't want just a cash transfer. And okay. then we will look at the kinds of works that they can be, we can use it for. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this uh, intervention. Um, yeah, so now we move on to the next uh, uh, speaker. I uh, call upon... Um, Professor Irudaya Rajan, uh, who is the founder chairman, uh, International Institute of Migration and Development, Tiruvananthapuram, uh, to uh, present his point of view. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fernandez. And also, I had Professor Arana Rai. So, I have already some points already made. I think other people also will make some point. I would like to uh, make, uh, I think, a uh, few points, not uh, so much on this uh, particular debate. One is that I think uh, what uh, Professor Arna Rai rightly said, I don't think we should play politics with the livelihood of the people. There's no politics. I was talking about every time. We should not talk politics with the demography, politics with the fertility. Similarly, we should not play politics with the livelihoods. And for example, uh, uh, Dr. Fernandez said rightly, there was a decline of budget earlier period. Now it has been increased. So I think this all has to be looked at it because we should not, uh, no government should do. If some government has introduced some program, we should look at it as a program, not look at it as the other party started this program. I think we should look at it. I see it in, 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 in Tamil Nadu, for example, when a new mill scheme was introduced by the ADMK several years back. In, in Tamil Nadu, the next government came, they did not stop it. They said, we'll add a yuk to the Noomi scheme. I think they should add something rather than trying to demolish any earlier program. I think you should add more. You know, don't need to, if something is working well, you can do auditing, as she rightly said, you can relook at it, you can reduce the corruption, which is, we know that every, every program, but you should say that, what can I contribute additional? What is called the, what I call them, MG, NRES, plus. The plus should be done by the new government, plus. Not uh, trying to you know, remove the program, plus. We always talk about now plus, everything we talk about plus. I think that, that was missing, I think the COVID-19 brought in. I think COVID-19 also did several good things. One of the things was that uh, to emphasize the rural livelihood issues. We have seen that during COVID-19. I think this is something uh, very, very important. And the second point about this, uh, this, this, uh, this livelihood option of the rural came in because of the huge return migration. Because there's a link between return migration from the urban areas to the rural area, or what we call them origin states. People were moving from destination state to origin, origin states. That also you know, informed us basically the urbanization has failed the people. Urban has failed the people. That, that is very important. Why did they go to, why they were running to back to their villages? Because as an urban planner, as an urbanization policy of the government, our urbanization itself has failed. They could not keep the people in the cities. 
that itself indicates something wrong for those people who were running back to their homes, running back to their homes because they are not getting anything in the city. I think that is also indicate indirectly cities have failed to protect the migrant during COVID-19. We also failed in, the, in terms of Interstate Migration Act. Interstate Migration Act says the employers should take care of their workers. If the employer has taken care of workers, why should the people are running back to their house? We have not seen any employer being arrested in this country because he could not take care of his uh, uh, workers, the construction industry. For example, the Honorable Prime Minister said during the first lockdown 1.0, what he said, be where you are, don't move. He said, be where you are. If you are where you are means somebody has to provide them stay, somebody has to provide them food, somebody has to provide them, uh, you know, not employment because you cannot work, but they have to pay the salaries. Many companies have not paid salaries, part salaries, the cities. I think nobody is talking about the, what I call them, daylight robbery. Daylight robbery by the so-called urban people of the poor migrants. I, that's why they were run back. I think that is something we should re-look at it. Why the urbanization? Why the smart cities we talk about in the NDA? Smart cities. What happened to smart cities? Like Delhi, Mumbai during COVID-19, we have seen. Of course, many people told me smart cities where during COVID-19, they were dying cities, not smart cities. And some city like Chennai, now we see them like a singing city doing the floods. So I think cities have failed. If cities have failed to protect the urban citizens who are part of Indian citizens, they are not come from other countries. They came from the villages. They come from other states. They are all Indians. We have failed them in the urban area. They run back to rural areas. I think that it came the, uh, the what is called the MG NRES. But MG NRES, I think it helped. I have seen that through some data. I think. Uh, Professor Arna is correct, it helped us. But for me, as a person who is working on migration, it has not helped enough. Because I see people are coming back to cities which treated them very badly during COVID-19. In fact, they put them, the migrants were given a label called the COVID carriers. And the train went from cities to the village, they are called Corona Express. So, the same people who went back to the villages, I think probably she's right. They were, they were joined the uh, NREG work. Probably they could not get salary or they got some difficulty. I see people are coming back. That itself indicate MSA, yeah, this MGNRES is successful, not successful enough. There is something we have to look at it. Enough to keep those people back there. I think we should look at it. Why that after so much distress, they rushed back home, they started coming back. In fact, my, my understanding right now, probably 60% of the returned migrants who went back to the rural area have returned. Only 30% are still left. I think we should look at it. Why some people have not come to cities? I talked to some people, they have not come to cities. They are still in the rural areas. But some people came back to cities again, though they were treated badly. I think that is something we should look at it, something can we make an improvement in the NREG to keep those people not to be, you know, the, you know, the exploited by the so-called urban citizens, urban, uh, you know, they are all urban poor in one sense, but that so-called urban workers. I think this is something we should look at it. The third point, they have come back. That means we have to look at it, what happened to them? Why we are not able to hold them in the village itself? I think that I put two points. One is probably, NRE wages, I think still, I feel it is low. NRE wages, I feel still it is low. And how much it should go? Because I remember when I go to Gulf countries to talk about minimum wages, you know, uh, you know, one of the person told me in Dubai or Saudi Arabia, he told me we don't have minimum wages. I said, forget about minimum wages, but what about the living wages? What about the living wages? If you want to live in a rural area to buy, with five members of the family, only two members have, uh, one member is joined in NREG, other member has no job, and they have to eat for all the 30 days. If you distribute the 100 days work in every month, they are only getting something like eight to 10 days maximum in a month. So can they able to live with that, what is called the 2000 plus rupees? So maybe we should re-look at it, 
we look at it because this is going to be an important program, as Professor Arna rightly said. It is going to be an important program on livelihood options, employment, nutrition, food, starvation. You know, you take anything. I think this is very, very important. Otherwise, we'll end up in, you know, even child labor. We are not talking about the right now during the COVID-19, what happened to the children of the poor families. So I think we have to think, maybe imagine, is the wages enough for the rural household? I think this question, we should replicate it. And we should think more on that. I would like probably some of the other speakers should pick it up on that. And the second point I would like to make it about the days. Is 100 days are enough? Because like if somebody is telling you, you come, we'll give you lunch. But what about breakfast and dinner? Because when we were running worker camps in Kerala for the migrant workers, we were giving all meals. We are giving full stay. You cannot say we'll give you one meal. But what about other two meals? Maybe that 100 days, that, that, that bracket, or we should tell them that you can pick up, like what Professor Arma said. You, you can pick up, if you want to work for 200 days, you can work. If you work for 150 days, you can work. I think that, that the days can be a little bit elastic. This is something I would like, we can, we can, we can think about that. And the way forward, only simple thing is, no, no question of politics. We should strengthen the NREG. Look at it, the way structure, why we have, even during epidemic, we have failed to keep those people back in the rural area. I think this is a big research to be done in this country. Why some people returning back? Is it because of the wages? Or is it not enough? They are coming back to cities. Now cities, the issue is that Many people, you know, talk to me. Many people, I do talk to them. Shall we think of the urban NREGA? Some people talk about that. I am not very, 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 very keen on having the similar urban NREGA because the question is wages. What wage you will fix up for the urban NREGA? Is the same like rural? Or the cost of the living will be in the cities or urban? So can we think of something a different package for urban poor. I know urban poor. I know starvation in slums. But rather than replicating the you know, NREG of rural to the just taking back to urban, can you imagine a new program? Can we think of something out of box idea to help the urban poor? Of course, most of the urban poor are basically the migrants. I was looking at some database from uh, Delhi uh, and Mumbai. The urban poor are basically who are came last two to three years back. The long-term migrants had not much problem even during COVID-19. So the short-term migrants. So I think we can imagine something for the urban poor in the cities. Some new, 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 new scheme. Not to replicate that because the wages fixing wages in the urban area will be something we should look at it. I'm going to stop here, Father Fernandez. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hiruda Rajan. Um, you, have, uh, you have emphasized the importance of uh, MGNREGA and uh, insisted that uh, you know, there should not be any politics on the livelihood of the people. Um, you have also said that, uh, uh, that MGNREGA uh, has been successful to a certain extent. But the very fact that uh, um, people have uh, migrants who returned back during the lockdown uh, came back to the cities, though they had a hard time in the cities during the lockdown, uh, is an indication that uh, we have to look at uh, MGNREGA and how to um, ensure that MGNREGA ensures uh, livelihood to the people in distress. And you have pointed out two things. One is the wages. Uh, wages uh, has been low. In fact, uh, the, the government had marginally increased the wages from 182 to 202. Uh, but uh, in individual states, they have also increased uh, nearly 300 in some states. Uh, but even then, uh, it is much lower than uh, uh, you know, uh, some of the minimum wages of the state. So uh, wage is very, uh, needs to be looked at. The other point was uh, the days, the number of days uh, in such uh, uh, you know, uh, stressful times like a pandemic, 
uh, whether 100 days is enough. In fact, some states had increased it to 150 days, but uh, uh, this needs to be uh, looked at uh, from the policy point of view and see how um, uh, you know, social security, especially employment guarantee can be extended and increased, especially uh, when it comes to uh, national disaster situations like the pandemic. Um, so, uh, and you also pointed out to the, uh, the idea or the call for an urban, uh, a new uh, sort of uh, system, thinking out of the box, uh, thinking of a scheme similar to that of MG and REGA in the urban area, but uh, with new vision so that uh, um, we are able to accommodate uh, the, the suffering of the, you know, to ameliorate, you can say, the, the suffering of the people, especially migrants in the urban areas. Uh, so thank you very much, Professor Iruda Rajan. Um, now I move on to um, Professor um, R.B. Bhagat. Uh, he is the head of the Department of Migration and Urban Studies at IAPS Mumbai. Uh, I invite you to uh, make your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez. And uh, I thank IMPRI for inviting me. I'm very glad to share uh, this panel, uh, eminent panelist. I listen, Professor Aruna Rai, uh, who has been very instrumental in initiating MG Narega. So I'm very happy to listen, Professor Rai, and my friend, colleague, uh, Professor Edda Rajan. I would like to emphasize what uh, Professor Rajan has said about migration and rural urban context. Uh, we in the country, we, uh, in India, we see a type of rural urban transformation, which is very different uh, from what has happened in West European country during the 18th century and later on 19th century in the wake of industrial revolution. So, during that period, there was massive rural to urban migration. And many of these countries were colonial power. So they, they also got the opportunity of emigrating, going outside uh, Britain or France or Portugal. So there was huge rural urban transformation. And rural, of course, disappeared. And since rural disappeared, there was no rural crisis or there was no agrarian crisis. But this has not happened in our country. Still, our GDP is growing, but we have huge population dependent on agriculture. 45% of the workforce of the country is dependent on agriculture. That contributes just 14%, 14% of the GDP. So you can see the massive rural urban divide in the country, and in that context, I think Manrega should be, MG Narega should be located as a minimum livelihood security. And I agree with Professor Rai that it should be nurtured, it should be strengthened. And pandemic has shown to us that how much it was important for the survival of the people of India. And had it not been there, India would have seen, I think, massive starvation death and it is not only the interstate migrant, those who have gone outside the state, but within the state migrant. Uh, migration is something, I think, when we look at in relation to Manrega, we have to uh, underline several things. And uh, uh, some of the understanding, I think, are not correct. One of the thing is that in our country, migration is huge, but uh, it is not the interstate migration which is the predominant. It is the within state migration. So Manrega was uh, used in Gujarat also, where when the uh, uh, diamond workers or uh, other in, uh, industries were closed, and then people of Gujarat who live, living in urban area, migrants moving to the rural area, Manrega was very very helpful during the lockdown. 
and of course in other parts of of the country so manrega i think the efficacy of manrega we have seen in lockdown in saving lives and uh, livelihood security a uh, food security of the people there are other issues which i need to emphasize that one thing uh, is that always we see manrega versus migration that if manrega is successful migration is going to decline and this is somewhere i think uh, a, it's not a correct way of correct and i would like to argue that manrega and migration should be seen to be integrated as a livelihood strategy while manrega gives a minimum security of livelihood migration is another form of livelihood a choice to the people in that context manrega and migration can have uh, various outcomes one of the outcomes could be that manrega can reduce migration which migration of course those which are of seasonal type temporary migration going for few months few weeks are uh, mostly scheduled caste scheduled tribe people who are very unskilled uneducated doing manual work now these people who are migrating seasonally maybe within a state or crossing and going to other state they do not have so much capability to take advantage of the urban opportunity manrega certainly is very helpful in reducing such type of migration but then there should be some minimum days and <clears throat> some of our study shows that if a uh, number of employment days is provided up to 90 days then it it could have impact in reducing a migration so there is a threshold it is not that manrega is implemented for few days or few weeks uh, and then it can reduce migration so it has a something Trace hold and at least uh, three months, ninety days, if provided. Certainly, those which are of distress type of migration, scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, and very illiterate people moving. So that is one outcome. Another outcome is that manrega and migration are complementary, and we find in our analysis of various sets of data that many migrant, uh, many households which are availing manrega. are also migrating it means that they are migrating for few months but when they come back to the village they are taking the advantage of also manrega so it it can be complementary uh, livelihood strategy and therefore how to integrate this thing manrega and migration not to see that one versus other one is alternative of other but one both of them can be complementary there can be third out, outcome also where manrega can encourage migration uh, how it can increase encourage as you know that migration is something also comes with certain cost everybody cannot migrate migration comes with certain cost and it is result of certain capability and therefore when manrega is 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 implemented or people take advantage of manrega they raise their certain level of income or certain capability and then they aspire more and then they can migrate so there can be any of the outcome it can discourage a migration it can reduce migration it can be complementary and therefore and it can also encourage migration nothing wrong about it uh, if people uh, have certain level of Uh, income or certain level of aspiration raised through manrega i think they have all right to migrate as per our uh, as per our fundamental rights uh, given by the constitution so therefore it should be designed in such a way that both can be complementary so in the off season agricultural season lot of uh, jobs are there in off season jobs are not there uh, and uh, during agricultural season people also migrate there are certain cycle seasonal cycle i think that seasonal cycle should be uh, kept in mind uh, in a, in a village uh, or panchayati in a panchayat system uh, in order to have a planning so the next point i like to emphasize that 
Manrega is of course has been helpful. It must be nurtured and strengthened. But we see that how Manrega is planned, how various sections of the people are integrated. I think that village plan is very, very important. And uh, how this village plan is prepared, uh, we have some information, some data that yes, village plan is prepared by villages, by panchayat, but when it goes to the block level and when it goes to the district level, plan gets completely changed. And then therefore it doesn't reflect uh, the true needs of the people. So it must be it must reflect uh, the true needs of the people and how uh, natural resources of the area can be utilized and developed, assets can be created. I think uh, it's not only simply social audit, but what you are going to audit. It is not that only the money and number of days, but of course the plan should be there and whether plan has the consent and approval of the Gram Sabha? Is it participatory planning or is, is it a only the expert driven planning? So somehow there should be combination of expert and people of the locally, local people who can evolve plan and that plan to be, to be, to be followed in letter and spirit uh, so that the uh, maximum benefits of Manrega uh, can be harvested. The, uh, another point that uh, we like to emphasize that it is not only a single program that we should talk about. Manrega is also related with PDS, food security, or health insurance. We have to see all programs together. And therefore, when we look at migration, again, I like to bring the portability of program, portability of rights, be it food security or be it, be it health rights or be it employment rights, so whatever, or even voting rights. Many people, those who are migrating are missing uh, the right to vote. Uh, so all this portability of program also to be, one should not look program in isolation, Manrega as such, but Manrega must be looked in relation to food security, health security, and housing security. I think that, and that can converge, I think, in, in a village plan. So planning is very important and of course, auditing. So these are some of my uh, initial thoughts and I'm very happy to participate. And uh, I'm further looking forward to hear and benefit from this panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bhagat, uh, for your uh, insights. You have, uh, in, you are in the IAPS, you have a lot of benefit of the, from uh, the data that you have. Um, and uh, you have rightly said that uh, intrastate migrants are more than interstate migrants. And, uh, um, and you have mentioned that, uh, you know, different ways in which, uh, you know, MG and REGA can be looked at uh, as uh, one to reduce migration, one as complementary, and one as uh, even uh, assisting a migration if uh, uh, households uh, have in adequate income to uh, pay for the cost of migration. And finally, you focused a lot on uh, uh, the village plan, that it be inclusive and reflects the needs of the, of the people. And, uh, and uh, MG and RGA must be looked at not uh, independently, but uh, in the context of other entitlements of the people like PDS and uh, other health and housing related. So thank you very much for your uh, intervention. Um, now I uh, call upon uh, Dr. Gurjeet Singh, uh, who is the State Coordinator Social Audit Unit Jharkhand a former consultant to the Ministry of Rural Development, Government of India. Uh, Gurjit Singh ji. Um, yes. 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 Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. I'll not be able to switch on my video because my connection is not uh, strong enough. So please bear with me. Okay. Uh, so so I, I listen to all uh, the uh, panelists and hi to Arunaji and Sandeep. Uh, long time to see them. 
So I think uh, three things that came up uh, during pandemic, I think three uh, things that came up uh, very strongly, three programs of the government that uh, uh, help people in a big way were MGNREGS, the NFSA, and the National Health Mission. The, the type of CSO engagement, the type of CSO help that uh, came in was tremendous. And also it was the first time that people realized how important these programs are, which were ridiculed by many as a you know, free dole or just uh, distribution of money. So one thing that the scope and the need and the urgency of these programs, I think was uh, well established during uh, this pandemic and it helped, uh, you know, many uh, were, uh, people to a large extent. What we also saw mainly in states of Bihar, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Odisha, is the migrant workers uh, were, uh, you know, they they are mainly skilled and semi-skilled people, but they also, you know, came up to you know, take the job cards and started doing MG and RGS work. So one challenge that lies ahead is how to now think of you know extending the scope of mg and regs its outlay and bringing in semi skill and other skill people in this ambit not compromising and diluting it with uh, uh, the the existing one so i think the financial outlay the scope needs to be widened in the challenging circumstances the second thing, if you look at the data, it this uh, you know pandemic also somehow you know uh, exposed or you can say you know uh, showed us the gaps in the planning and implementation processes of MG and RGS. So you see, you know, when many workers started coming up and the rains came through, you know that the whole the planning was could not be done as Gram Sabhas could not be held. So the whole, uh, you know, that aspect of uh, uh, having the self works, you know, was not there at all. So the preparation where you have all that uh, schemes with administrative and financial uh, sanction with you, so that whenever the demand comes, you are able to, uh, you know, start the work. So I think that concept of planning and preparation before the financial start with each uh, villages and GPs, having the shelf of works, I think that needs to be again re-established and redesigned so that every panchayat has that shelf of works ready when the need arises. So I, the third thing that uh, I think is uh, very remarkable is though uh, the people who were doing MG and REGS, uh, the families which were under MG and REGS ambit had increased considerably, but in that percentage, the number of families completing 100 days have not uh, uh, seen any significant change. You know, in Jharkhand uh, last year, 40,000 families did, did complete 100 days. This year, only many 65,000 people completed 100 days. So <clears throat> I think now we should also think of having uh, MG and RNGS as an individual entitlement and then a family entitlement. <coughs> That's the only way that you, know, you can, so increasing number of days to 50 days or other days will not help because uh, only, you know, very few percentage of people are completing 100 days due to different, you know, implementation gaps and uh, process defaults. So I think that also needs to be looked into and that's a big challenge how we make this family entitlement into an individual entitlement the other things as a social audit which we have seen is with the financial outlay rising with less monitoring being done due to restrictions in you know movements uh, the pilferers and the corruption also rose up you know so normally what we could find was 25 percent people you know who were uh, whose names were there in the MR were not found in the work site that increased to up to 65 to 70 percent in case of many panchayats. So that's a significant rise in corruption that has come up uh, during uh, pandemic. And I think it will be all over the country because uh, because of less movement, less uh, 
you know monitoring systems in place travel restrictions i think uh, so people have found out you know uh, scope in the you know pandemic also for lot of pilfered so i think the transparency measures the village vigilance and monitoring committees the periodic concurrent audits the social audits and you know all these community processes needs to be strengthened you know re uh, designed and i think focus should be there that with increasing uh, you know financial outlay uh, we need to have that checks and uh, you know systems also in place to look into the uh, so that the pilfer doesn't happen and uh, the scheme doesn't get a bad name the fourth thing that aruna ji and many people uh, also argued is that this actually has laid a need for an urban employment guarantee program as part of uh, the team which uh, tried to design an urban employment guarantee program in jharkhand and very truly one speaker had said the nature of the workers in urban areas their financial needs their expertise the type of works they are doing uh, the type of works they can be engaged to are quite different than you know an rgs and i think though uh, this um, uh, pandemic has uh, you know stressed the need for an urban employment guarantee as well we need to be very cautious uh, in designing in framing in uh, you know uh, talk in uh, wages i think that is important the last thing that many people have said is we now really need to you know restructure the wage uh, components you know jharkhand did increase its uh, uh, wage uh, to 20, 25 rupees increase through their state coffers i think the need is that it should be at par with the state minimum uh, guarantee and i think uh, uh, that can help uh, much issues of uh, you know people getting you know wages the last thing i forgot to add it that we also need to think of you know different types of uh, schemes that can be done so we have to think about dovetailing we have to think about convergence we have to think about you know uh, different departments coming up so that these variety of schemes will like in jharkhand they came up with the nutrition garden didi badi they came up with you know shgs having nurseries and in chatisgarh also they have come up with the development of pastoral lands and all so now we have to think of different because of you know uh, uh, gradually the scope of you know ponds uh, digging renovation uh, decreasing with uh, continuous uh, mgnr just work we need to think of different agro uh, forestry and horticulture and other type of uh, works which can you know enhance livelihood opportunities and also ensure that work is available all the time and there is not uh, no pressure on implementing agency ki where to give work to when the demand comes so i think with these words i'll conclude thank you thank thank you very much uh, dr gurjit singh uh, for uh, you know your intervention and several suggestions that you have made uh, you have uh, you know uh, stress the need of extending the scope of rga increasing financial play uh, ensuring that uh, uh, you know uh, pilferage and corruption is reduced or eliminated as far as possible uh, improving monitoring processes putting systems in place also um, uh, restructuring wages bringing it Uh, mg and reg wage up to minimum wage and uh, uh, you know dovetailing different schemes uh, into this so that uh, there is a continuous and adequate uh, work uh, in the rural areas and finally you uh, you know uh, dr uh, gurjit singh also hinted at uh, the need of uh, urban employment guarantee as well with uh, uh, adequate uh, safeguards uh, so that uh, they are able to address similar um, uh, unemployment distress uh, especially in times of uh, uh, pandemic uh, like disasters which is going to be frequent because uh, we already saw the first wave and uh, we thought that the first wave was uh, you know getting over we thought it's going to be the end after the vaccine came in 
and then came the second wave and uh, that has now declined and now we are uh, having uh, the possibility of another wave so uh, we will have to live with this and so uh, we need to take into account uh, uh, social security measures such like uh, such as mg and rega uh, now um, over to um, our next speaker, uh, Sandeep Chachara. He is the executive director of uh, ActionAid India. Um, I welcome you to make your make your presentation. Thank you, Father Denzil. Uh, lovely to have you here. And greetings to Arunaji, and of course Guruji Ji was here with all the panelists. And greetings to everybody who is listening in from ActionAid. Uh, I want to begin by saying various facets of uh, MG and RGS. In this context, uh, it's almost a 20-year-old program, a little less than that, that have been examined by the authors and those who researched on the program, both on the ground as, as well as more academically and on the economics of it. And I think many facets have been discussed today. Uh, with, re with reference to how it could again become a demand-driven program, which it always was, uh, with the reference to budget allocations, mm -hmm. with reference to the kind and nature of works, with reference to the urban context, the context of migration. So all those have been discussed. And one cannot not disagree with any of the issues made, particularly with reference to the survival nature or the critical nature of MGNREGS, uh, and that it has served over the last two decades uh, to at least keep uh, informal workers, landless agricultural workers, other masses and working classes of India from starvation. So that's the context, uh, I think, largely, which we've been exploring today. And one cannot disagree with any of those. And I would say the interim nature of MGNREGS itself, for when it was crafted, and that's the way I've looked at it, uh, that it serves as more or less a safety net program uh, from, from letting the worker fall hard on the ground. So it serves a net somewhere to break that fall. And I think I want to go there because most of the points have been made and I want to go there in the context of uh, if we have to seize this time, uh, the continued crisis of the last decade and a half almost now. Uh, and if you have to seize this time as movements, as people's formations, as academics, as those who are part of the civic society uh, and those who are the progressive elements within political and trade union formations, then I think the debate must extend beyond. If we have to liberate ourselves from the prisons of history, uh, then it must certainly go much more beyond uh, our current imagination of what should be the employment uh, nature and, and what kind of programming uh, would it need for that would need to be demanded. And I say this because uh, you very well know that over half of world's population, I think much more than half actually, is, is not in any kind of salaried employment. So they are either informal workers or they are under an un unemployed unemployed in particular, or they are in unpaid domestic drudgery and work. Uh, so that's where I want to begin. But if you want to bring that number back to India, I would argue, and the data is available, I don't have it at the moment here, uh, that well over three-fourths of our population, uh, that includes, of course, most of the women uh, who are not in any kind of uh, uh, employment at all, even informal, and, and there is what, what, what I called uh, domestic work, which is not recognized as any form of productive employment by the society per se. Uh, and that includes a uh, young population. In fact, uh, the worrying figures from India and around the world are in the 15 to 24 age group uh, of employment of, of young people. And that also includes children who are about to become employable. Uh, so if you sort of look at all that and the current informal uh, sector workers, which uh, by many estimations number to around 54 crores of Indians, out of the 100, a population of 130 crores or so. So well over three-fourths or there around of our people are in a very tenuous relationship with 
employment with wages i won't call it employment but with wages uh, and and that is uh, that is you know uh, periodic and many things can be said uh, that that is very sporadic uh, that is quite irregular uh, it can happen may not happen some days in a week some days in a month and that's the relationship with wage labor that they have now uh, if we sort of go further uh, the, the bigger question is uh, the divide between productive labor and the reproductive labor uh, so if you were to sort of look at that there is a, the largest burden of the society uh, the largest burden of accumulation of capital which was talked about by aruna roy ji by giving some uh, let me say uh, some indicators of how capital accumulation takes place Uh, by uh, visiting the channel of inequality uh, through some statistics in the beginning of of this discussion i mean we all know that anybody in the ground knows that uh, that the world is highly highly inequal uh, and and it's so visible it's so visible and put to have those numbers uh, but having said that uh, if if the largest burden of accumulation uh, which was discussed here a bit falls on women because we know women are in reproductive labor largely yeah? uh, so in in some ways if we were to liberate ourselves from there uh, i i think it's time uh, the time has long come and i won't say the time has come now uh, it's long overdue that we have a employment rights framework from a feminist women's perspective a uh, women's perspective let me say it for now let me not just call it a feminist perspective although that's the argument i would make it needs to be a feminist perspective but let me just limit it to say we do need a women's rights uh, women's employment rights framework uh, from uh, for for women and for all the other working classes uh, you know when when we are talking about it and i think that's the demand we need to be making because you know this whole question uh that informal workers can get some solace uh through some form of wage labor doesn't change the structure of employment at all and i think that's where we need to be looking at employment equity in times to come uh, in in terms of uh, in terms of how the argument should all of us should be uh, sort of thinking of uh, because uh, that probably is the new future uh, that will offer any form of dignity any form of what uh, professor rajan called living wage let alone let alone uh, you know sort of dignified lives uh, to 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 the large majorities of our people and i think that's the argument that needs to be made and there are issues in that uh, and let me just go to the issues which professor bhagat began with but didn't go there for for reasons of uh, focusing on migration and that's to say that uh, to assume that uh, where the agrarian transition cannot happen to assume that the agrarian transition uh, can copy what what happened in the north and we can afford to copy that is a fallacy is a historical fallacy uh, the fact that you can move people out of agriculture and and put them into non agrarian futures um, is a fallacy which which has been achieved at huge world cost huge exploitation cost by the north Uh, and we all know that uh, we all know how the agrarian transition happened in the united kingdom for instance or in germany for instance or or in other countries in particularly in in europe uh, at for that matter uh, and that that was through the engine of uh, exporting people uh, and and huge exports of people into the into the ends of colonial world uh, be it americas be it australias be it south of americas be it be it southern tips of africa so there is an you know sort of a push out of people from the agriculture sector and 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 you may remember uh, the the famines uh, and the irish famines uh, and and what happened to farmers thereof uh, but that's one trajectory that uh, was adopted at particular times the other bit is this whole question called labor intensive industrialization processes now we of course don't have labor intensive uh, you know intensive industrialization processes at this stage uh, and on the reverse we have lay, lay, uh, what is called job loss and jobless growth now or what is called labor you know sort of cutting out uh, industrial processes so in such a scenario uh, we we are going to generate by this strategy of pushing out people from agriculture and you know that's happening and that is why the farmers protest in part at least uh, by starvation of uh, peasant agricultures or by starvation of agricultures in the country and this is not just an indian phenomenon it's a pretty much global phenomenon 
uh, of corporatization and industrialization of agriculture itself. So you have on the one hand, people being pushed out of agriculture, uh, and you have on the other hand, therefore, uh, a huge, huge swelling reserve of labor across and, and a, a labor reserve which is constituted disproportionately by women. Uh, and of course, the oppressed history, people with oppressed histories. So in such a situation, uh, you just can't rely on the path of MG and REJ or on the path of wage labor uh, as a strategy of achieving any form of equity, let alone egalitarianism. So therefore, the question of agrarian reforms, now, you know, I want to make another point. Reforms mean many things to many people. Uh, reforms is one of those words uh, which, which, which you can use to your own convenience. But a, a land reform and an agrarian reform, which is popular agrarian reform, which is for the people, is needed. And, and I think that's where the whole debate needs to come together and not just in bits and parts that we argue for urban employment on the one hand, we argue for MG and REG on the other hand, it is not. Uh, and obviously the, uh, uh, con, you know, the question of town and countryside or the urban and the rural cannot be separated and seen in isolation. Uh, so land reforms therefore becomes fundamental and the model of agriculture therefore becomes fundamental. How do we look at agriculture itself? Uh, what kind of uh, revival of, uh, of course, technology comes in, but that doesn't mean technology shifts the control away for farmer. Uh, but what kind of drudgery reduced peasant farming uh, can, can be thought of? So that's the second point I'd want to make, uh, that in this strategy going ahead of creating employment, uh, uh, whether through the instrument of MG and REG or others, land reforms needs to be a central pillar. My third point is with reference to, uh, and that's my last uh, within the time limit that we have today. My third point is with reference to the question of Therefore, what form of livelihoods was being talked of? Uh, and, and Professor Rajan uh, sitting in Kerala was talking of that and he did allude to it. But I do wish to say that what form of live, rural livelihoods are we thinking and how are we thinking become central. Uh, and Kerala is a land, for instance, uh, since he mentioned this, uh, is a land, for instance, which has experimented very, very, and there are deep histories there of uh, collective, if I may call it, collective forms of enterprise or collective forms of production uh, and marketing and so on and so forth by, by a name we know very well in India, the cooperative movement or the cooperatives. So I think this whole question of uh, whether it is FPOs to an extent, farmer producer organizations to an extent, uh, whether it is labor collectives to an extent, uh, cooperative industrialization, cooperative production, uh, cooperative enterprises are very much needed. Uh, workers control over enterprise is very much needed in order to pursue any strategy uh, which offers a dignified possibility of a future uh, to, to people. So I'll keep that point limited. If there are questions, we can discuss it more. But these are the three points I'll make. So first, uh, a, a very dire need for a rights-oriented women's employment framework and policy or legislation, however you want to sort of uh, level it. Second, the issue of land and agrarian reforms as integrated and deeply connected. Third, as a cooperative, a cooperative path or a collective path to the future of creating employment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sandeep. <laughs> uh, you have... Uh, you know, uh, looked at the larger picture and uh, gone into um, the, you know, ways way, uh, employment has been uh, generated and you have, have uh, and Sandeep has uh, said that, uh, you know, we should move into rights-oriented employment, focus on uh, land reforms and a cooperative path to, uh, you know, employment. So, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, so we have heard uh, all this uh, from our eminent uh, speakers and there have been some very important uh, points made by them. Um, I would now, uh, if there are any um, uh, Dr. Arjun, is there any questions from 
anyone? Yes. Yeah. yes, there is one question by Jankri Kadalaji that Manrega is a distress strategy. However, the rigorous physical work may not be necessarily appropriate health-wise for rural women seeking employment. So do you think usage of technology and higher budget for capital is necessary for designing the program accordingly? And this is for Professor Aruna Roy, ma'am. And Dr. Jayanthi Kajaliji is from Gokhale Institute, Pune. Any, any other question? Uh, yes, I'm looking for uh, uh, Dr. Sasbiswas is asking that great number of uh, migrant laborers in cities learn through their micro level employment, mechanical and other technical needs. Do we have a database? More of a number question. And many points we have uh, covered uh, earlier also. There was also something called Prahan Matri Garib Kalyan Rojgar Yojana also for migrant laborers, which came in for a very limited point of time, but uh, some budget related questions. So, uh, sir, uh, Dr. Denzel, would you like to ask any, any question to specific to any panelist? We can do one round. Um, and if they want to reflect. No, I mean, yeah, uh, basically, you know, this, uh, the, the whole uh, experience of the pandemic uh, ha has uh, resulted in some amount of uh, uh, responses from the, from the government. One has been to increase uh, budget allocation the other one uh, of, of Narega, the other one has been to uh, increase the wages. Uh, the third has been to um, increase the number of days. Um, and uh, uh, so these have been, you know, um, these have been some uh, reactions. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have to, uh, we have to see this MG NREGA in the context of the larger uh, social security system uh, of the of the country, which also includes, uh, you know, the PDS. Uh, this has also been backed by the extension of uh, th this whole uh, Prime Minister uh, Garib Kalyan Yojana, which uh, provided subsidized uh, grains to people, and uh, 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 a social saf safety net uh, for people who are vulnerable, uh, this is, uh, you know, this, this is part of the architecture and the architecture uh, should be uh, robust so that there's no, um, th there's no citizen of the country that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, uh, has to suffer, has to starve, has to uh, face uh, hunger because uh, during this uh, pandemic, uh, we know that uh, the people uh, people who are hungry, hunger has uh, also increased, deprivation has increased, but uh, schemes like Narega has, uh, MG and REJ has been uh, something that has prevented uh, large scale starvation and people have been able to move on, even uh, return back to the, the cities. So uh, what I would like to, so what we could do is we could just uh, uh, take a round of uh, final uh, comments and uh, way forward. Um, you know. Sir, there are two, two more questions that have come in. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Nagarajan Krishna Mutuji is saying that, is there any research on employment benefit of migrant workers? And then another is, is uh, Manrega social security scheme or development scheme or combined scheme? Uh, Professor Sandhya here, ma'am, from TIS is asking to Dr. Gurjit Singh, sir, that he mentioned about rise in corruption in the Manrega implementation. Uh, do you think uh, that Manrega be class classified as frontline activity would have ensured better participation and monitoring at the Gram Panchayat level? So uh, Manrega be classified as frontline activity for uh, monitoring, especially to Gurjit, sir. So, okay, we can go to the panelists. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Bernandez. Yes. Uh, I may have to leave by six o'clock, so I may take two minutes to yeah, see. Huh? Okay. Are going going beyond six, then I may have to leave. Uh, I just want to make only one point. I don't think I am going to answer. Uh, you know, I saw a lot of messages. I think one thing I thought I should speak something about the missing data. Somebody asking that do you have urban migrant data? We have no data on migrants in the country right now. 
the census also has not happened in 2021 is postponed so i think this migration database creation should be one of the priority so that you can understand the urban poor urban migrants even rural migrants you know because migration is going to be the the future of this economy because you can't talk about economy without talking about migrants so they are the backbone of the economy we are not talking about how much the migrant contribute for the gdp in this country so the migration and the migrants i think we have to take it very seriously in fact i was i was even talking in one context every state they have a they have a planning board they have so many things in the state they have all economic advisor i have not seen any state as you know putting a migration advisor in the government why why migration is not important we have seen during covid 19 but you have economic advisor law advisor so many advisor i see them uh, to the government of india and government of every state but why there is no migration advisor you have economic advisor why migration also economics in one sense i think those type of thing we should we should start talk about that because migration is part of a big activity because in my estimate is 600 million people in the country are living in a place they are not born 600 million people that includes me that includes professor bhagat that includes our honorable prime minister so we should have yeah you know we should take that migrants as a it's a very serious subject we are talking in a very very light sense on migration i want to stop here okay uh, thank you uh, professor irudha rajan um, can we move to uh, professor aruna roy Yeah. sure i mean it's been a very rich discussion and i want to say greetings to sandeep and gurjeet who wished me particularly we haven't seen each other for a while especially because of covid and other reasons very nice to see you though virtually and thank you very much dr denzel fernandez for this very interesting evening when i've heard a lot of views and quickly go through uh my six points five points that i have and then i'll answer just clubbing all the questions together i'll make a few statements i think there should be a new charter of demands that we should drop for the nreg and we should all agree with it because there are so many things we want to do which we are all doing in a scattered way there is the uh, we have uh, narega sangarsh samiti and we have the people's action for employment guarantee which have been working concertedly on many issues but we can suggest to them and we can join them but the point is we need a collective campaign we look, need to look at the various efforts of the urban employment program and we have to come together to form a campaign for urban employment otherwise it's not going to happen if there hadn't been a campaign for mgnreg in which we collected millions of signatures i did not think i do not think the mgnreg would have come to be so we have to do a campaigning and a grounds on hands grounds program that will bring people together for a, a urban employment program and i think i'm very glad that many of the people i rushed through my points it's such a space that i forgot so one vital issue which i'm very glad many of you have raised which is the minimum wage the minimum wage has not been updated for many states we are really drawing a dismal rate so one battle is for minimum wages outside mgnreg to have it raised but the minimum wage should be the least the mgnreg should pay it pays less than the minimum wage it's a shame and i really think we should all insist that the minimum wage be part of the mgnreg and i endorse whatever has been said by my friends on the panel today i think we need an increase in the number of days of employment because actually if you look at unemployment figures all over it's really the rural rural india is under distress there are so many kinds of small industries and small small units of production that have all closed every sector is suffering every sector that is rural based is suffering so we should ask for an increase in numbers of days for overall number of days and times of disaster till the disasters are under control there must be mgnreg in that area declared specially by the state government by the government of india whatever is the concern department and ministry the narega campaigns we have become kind of invisible the campaign has become invisible the demands and the issues have become predominant even narega has to reassemble itself into the campaign mode to get all these things through and that's up to us whether we really form a, a campaign to fight for all these demands and one of the additional demands we should fight for is social audit 
Purjeet is here and he knows more than I do about the problems of all the social audit units. And I'm ashamed to say that Rajasthan government has dragged its feet. We've fought so many battles. The social audit unit has not taken off. There is a campaign against social audit within the bureaucracy because they don't want it to happen. Those Supreme Court and the CAG have said social audit should come with each package of programs that the government spends on. Uh, we have to have an education program in which every rural employer or, or every rural worker in MG and RG understands the nature of social audit and its importance and campaigns for it. What uh, this is my points, and I would like to answer the few questions that it is not a distress program. Uh, hard physical labor is the only alternative you're leaving for people at the cutting edge. We are not looking at alternatives. It is important we look at alternatives. Of course it is. But till such time, people have to survive. They have to have livelihood. They have to take money home for daily bread and daily living. So the NGNRG will stay till such time as a coherent and creative alternative is built. Is it social security or a development program? It's, uh, it's not social security. It's a, a right which the constitution has given me. It has given me a right to employment because it's a right to life and livelihood. So therefore, as an Indian citizen, I have a right to employment. That's it, what it's given me. And incidentally, if there's my social security, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bonus. But basically I'm saying I have a right to work in my own country and I have a right to get that work guaranteed by the state. It is a development scheme because after all, they are now being forced to look at development with all its failures. If you look at their achievements in creating assets, in my area in Rajasthan, we have created so many water collection points, rainwater harvesting points, that crops have increased and we've been able to increase agriculture. Uh, yes, Narega needs social monitoring and that it is NREGA is one of the best methods of social monitoring of the government. And that's why there's so much animosity against NREGA by all the power elite and in the rural areas. And there's so many pitched battles. I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Aruna Roy. Nice to uh, hear these uh, uh, insights. Um, and especially the point that, you know, uh, MG NREG gives people the right to employment. And that is a very critical right for, especially for livelihood. Um, uh, I invite now um, Professor Bhagat uh, to make his... Uh, yeah, thank you. Dr. Fernandes, I think there are several questions regarding data, and I think uh, that is rightly uh, raised. And uh, we have data, as Professor Rajan has said, outdated data from census or national sample survey. Uh, but we do have uh, data on migration uh, that is not uh, updated, and uh, data by educational level industrial composition, occupational composition of the migrants, we do have data. But this, we have to see that migration is not a single form, it has multiple form. And what data we have in census or NSSO, it largely pertains to permanent and semi-permanent migrants, uh, like me and Professor Rajan or many of others uh, who are well included in the urban system, but what we are lacking the data is the seasonal temporary short-term migrants. Uh, so that data is uh, not available. And this is the category of people who uh, were badly affected during the pandemic. Uh, and section of this category who started walking down on the roads. So uh, this data is very much needed. But again, then data should not come always from the top. Data can be generated at a grassroots level. So the, my point is that how we can uh, strengthen planning process at the planning uh, at the panchayat level. And we cannot uh, strengthen planning process unless we have data. We must, uh, I think, underscore the fact that data is a resource and this must be documented and compiled at the panchayat level, integrating with migration and Manrega. The people who are getting benefit of the Manrega, availing Manrega, 
but then the migration status i was looking at the database of ministry of rural development website i didn't find but our study shows that uh, many people uh, who are availing manrega are also migrating so i think there is a need to strengthen database at the panchayat level and without that i think planning process and other things uh, uh, will cannot be strengthened so this is a uh, uh, one thing that, that i would like to uh, emphasize other is that yes long term employment creation opportunity that is labor intensive utilization and uh, we can see that uh, this has to be in the uh, sector which is outside agriculture uh, how uh, what type of agriculture we can develop is it uh, that uh, uh, food grain production or no, non food grain production uh, so diversification is very important as you know that food grain production has a limited elasticity of demand we are producing 300 million ton uh, but when we start producing 350 million ton or so uh, the, it it has its own implication the prices can go down or it, so farmers may not benefit so the real question of agriculture is how to diversify agriculture how to create off farm jobs and therefore uh, linking rural and urban uh, urbanization policy uh, bringing urban amenities to the rural area pura uh, and we have also uh, urban mission all these i think we have to take the opportunity of all these special strategy uh, of creating Uh, employment so and one more question is that whether there is a study on migration we have a large scale study uh, on up eastern up and bihar and we have found that the 50% of the household have at least one migrant 50% household those who are uh, uh, moving from rural to urban areas and leaving their families behind so you can imagine the extent of split family Uh, fa- families which are headed by women and elderly child all are la- left behind but then they are able to send money 3 to 4000 rupees per month it means 25000 to 30000 rupees around yearly they are sending and that goes into uh, the f- food security or children's education or health care etc so these are uh, some of the positive aspects and there are also some of the Uh, negative aspects associated with that so we have a study and migration uh, has been proved to be a livelihood strategy there is no doubt about that thank you very much thank you uh thank you professor bhagat uh, for your um for your insights uh, i move on to dr gurjit singh yeah so i think the final points uh, some of the questions raised are genuine and i think uh, uh, there can be only one substitute to mgnrj that is better mgnrj so so let's uh, i think try for uh, getting all that uh, you know uh, that things that are laid down in the act all the provisions for participation entitlements transparency accountability and uh, you know uh, using this mgnr ej as an opportunity for deepening democracy to deal with all the environmental livelihood and equity issues so i think uh, mgnr ej provides us many things apart from assets it talks about processes it talks about protocols it talks about ensuring rights and entitlements it also talks about ensuring transparency and accountability it fixes the you know it has a it talks about robust grievance redressal mechanism so i think it talks uh, participation in all its uh, nature so so participation in assessing participation in planning participation in implementation and participation in reviewing and monitoring all the participation you know uh, avenues for a citizen in a democracy has been enshrined in mgnrg so i think let us uh, try to get that spirit of mgnr just alive thank you uh thank you very much uh, dr gurjit 
for emphasizing that uh, we need to uh, you know uh, improve upon mg and rj and insist uh, on the proper implementation according to the spirit of uh, the act uh, finally uh, sandeep uh, okay thank you way forward yeah I mean, there can be no debate that uh, an alternative to MG NREG is a better NREG or uh, what is called uh, more, more encompassing NREG. And I completely agree with Dr. Gurjeet. Uh, I think uh, I'm slightly worried as well because, and it's an opportunity as well, there is a, there is an, some kind of an advanced draft of an employment policy uh, doing rounds within the bureaucracy at least. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's something we all need to look at. And uh, this whole webinar was posited as an employment debate as well, apart from MG and REG. Uh, so I, I think I think we we probably need to sort of seize that moment. And I completely concur with our leader Arunaji uh, to say that uh, probably uh, I'm going to be add to her to say that probably an employment campaign, a right to employment campaign, is needed at this moment. Uh, you know, uh, I sometimes working with uh, dispossessed uh, people around, as several others of you and others do. You know, uh, sometimes uh, if I look at MGNREJ from the framework of pastoralists, uh, if I look at MGNREJ from the framework of what is called decriminalized tribes, we do denotify tribe tribes and we. Uh, the ex-criminal uh, tribes and so on and so forth. Or if I look at it from the perspective of uh, fisher folk, coastal and inland, uh, if I look at it from the perspective of, uh, you know, uh, you probably don't find cobblers these days, do you? Or not as many numbers. If I look at it from the perspective of caste-based occupations, however horrendous they may have been, and nobody is justifying those, uh, uh, and and we've, we've been sort of working closely there as well. Uh, and I'm not going to go labor into, uh, take more time into going into the varied communities of this continental country like ours, uh, indigenous people, some of them, uh, tribal peoples. If I look at it from the perspective of refugees, uh, uh, you know, 10% of the global population is stateless or refugees. And we have... Uh, unnumbered people here as well. Uh, there are limits to which MG and RG can take us. Uh, I mean, the question simply is, uh, should all the fisher folk bereft of uh, rights over commons, uh, the rivers and, and the sea, sea coasts around, uh, should they now be into the framework of MG and RGS, uh, which essentially turns them into a wage labor of various kinds, uh, I, I think uh, I think we need to sort of look uh, at those dimensions as we are calling what Gujiji said uh, a better MG and uh, or, or or a more diverse MG and uh, employment guarantee and rights. Yes, and I think in that rights framework, uh, that is why uh, somewhat I was bringing up this question of uh, agrarian and agrarian doesn't just only limit itself to the question of farming on land. Uh, so, so there are diverse habitats, and that includes fishing, for instance. Uh, that will include nomadic pastoralism, for instance. I'm just giving an example illustratively. So I, I think we need to sort of look at it in that context. Now, in as much as the question of, uh, and, and this is not a departure from MGNREG, I want to emphasize that because I'm not talking MGNREG language, yeah? Uh, but it is not a departure from MGNREG. Uh, what I'm attempting to say is, uh, uh, a more diverse employment rights perspective uh, in the framework of dignity is the call of the hour now. It, it has been a long, you know, let me say an unborn child. Yeah. We need to fight it. We need to fight it. And there, is, there is, can be no alternative to, to that struggle. Uh, left to itself, uh, left to uh, possibly the draft that is doing uh, rounds in the corridors of power, uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, and and I and I think we 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 do need to construct that 
uh, let me say this on those those perspectives uh, a thinking uh, which has been constructed uh, many years ago by probably one of the few countries uh, which just doesn't give a rhetoric of employment rights in their constitution but has a program to it uh, and i think it needs to be elaborated now and i think that's a good starting point it was uh, but comes the second decade of this century uh, the question of uh, women's work is completely vacuous yeah completely vacuous uh, even in mj and rg let me look, look at it from that dimension yeah yes women will get work uh, but i think the time now asks for a fundamental shift in that nature of work uh, equal wages is is achieved through mj and rg to a large degree to all degree i would say but equal wages in the society is is probably a, a dream we all have uh, and it's not just equal wages alone it it's also Uh, how we recognize women's work how we celebrate women's work how we are able as a society to share women's work how we are able to value women's work uh, when some countries have gone ahead and started paying uh, uh, family work or unpaid work and within care work within the families uh, is it something we should be looking at there are many there, there are many pros and cons to it but there are perspectives to it and i, I think uh, as a country we have enough Uh, to learn from those and uh, from our own, own past and present, uh, to sort of visit those uh, avenues, if I may call it, uh, this to me is the moment, because uh, it 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 is not a new crisis. COVID may have exaggerated all these or unmasked. While it put masks on our face, it has unmasked a lot of horrid realities. Uh, but it's it's a it's a continued crisis for the last thirteen years. and uh, data of inequality is is just one small indicator but the global south lives in almost mass and permanent impoverishment a larger number of people in the global south and we just can't we, we just can't sort of uh, uh, look at it from the perspective of uh, uh, a particular program of history it has to be elaborated further as aruna ji said uh, to revive those campaigns it has to uh, sort of reinvent itself as other speakers have said in the context of urban in the context of migration obviously it is not an answer to migration cannot be because it at the best has offered 40 or 50 days 60 days of employment somewhere in particular territories maybe 100 uh, but in practice that's what it is uh, and has been that's the history uh, so un- unless we sort of look at year round employment Uh, how do we sort of and and the kind of wages it gives uh, wages of uh, 202 per day uh, or 250 per day and therefore the question of wage itself what's a decent wage itself we've lost one of those battles uh, the the definition of decent wage itself is a minimalistic definition even or in application very very minimalistic uh, we all we all were part uh, including all the speakers here and others were part of demanding Eighteen thousand rupees per month as the basic flow, even that's not really dignified. Uh, but in any case, it's not there. So I think even if in the best course uh, uh, we have uh, employment of of thirty days through the in in M G N R E G, that basically means six thousand bucks a year, say six thousand bucks a month. Yeah, at this at this time. So it can therefore not be an alternative. Uh, it it it's not going to be enough to survive. Uh, for families to survive and that too at the family level what gurjit ji was mentioning is not in individual cards in any case so i would want to say that i think it's a good moment i i thank impri for and you for hosting this uh, wonderful webinar uh, and i think this these help in creating more momentums uh, to go towards uh, employment rights campaigning uh, nationally bring a lot of actors into it uh, that time is important and covid uh, has given us a reason to do so ever more urgently thank you uh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, uh, sandeep uh, you always have uh, deep insights into not only uh, you know the issue of mg and rga but on employment issues uh, also so uh, i think uh, we have had uh, more than an hour and a half of uh, deliberations and uh, i uh, thank all the panelists uh, professor aruna roy uh, dr gurjeet singh uh, professor indra rajan professor bhagat and sandeep for their 
wonderful presentations and insights. Uh, I think all of you have uh, you know, mentioned the importance of MGNREGA. It has started uh, about 15 years ago. And uh, over the last uh, uh, decade and a half, we have uh, witnessed how it has functioned uh, under the patronage of the, the government that initially uh, designed it. And then when uh, there were a lot of doubts, uh, and uh, in fact, it was uh, seen as a symbol of failure, as uh, Aruna Roy mentioned. But uh, uh, now it has proved, especially during this, uh, in fact, uh, uh, right from uh, demonetization time, uh, there has been an increase in uh, demand for uh, MG and EGA jobs. And now the pandemic has made it uh, really, um, you know, it has exceeded uh, one lakh crore uh, in the uh, uh, no, demand. So the government has always found itself short of money and uh, in the last couple of years and has had to uh, make additional uh, allocation for MG and NREGA. This shows that uh, people are demanding work and uh, they are in distress and they need uh, to survive. And this has uh, been one um, scheme that has uh, helped people uh, um, to a large extent to ameliorate the, their suffering and their distress, especially during pandemic times, and especially when uh, there has been so much rampant uh, unemployment and distress. Having said that, uh, there has been a lot of uh, I mean, efforts to uh, see how to um, deal with uh, the the problems and issues, um, there have been uh, not only increased allocation, but the increased number of days, uh, also uh, increase uh, wages, but this has been minimalist. And uh, I think all the speakers have, uh, have stressed that we need to uh, look at uh, the serious issues of MJ and REJ. Uh, one is the, the wage issue, uh, make it a decent wage, uh, minimum wage, even more than that, uh, so that people can uh, survive. Uh, the other thing is to, to uh, extend it, make it uh, during pandemic times, make it available all through the year if possible, and, uh, and to include new types of work, and uh, uh, Sandeep has also uh, gone into the larger issue of uh, employment. You know, uh, I mean, MG and REGA is employment guarantee, but um, in, in rural areas, but how about a uh, right to employment in general for all, all peoples? You know, even in MG and REGA, we find that uh, so many of those who have uh, applied for jobs, I think, uh, up to uh, 13 to even 20% of those who have applied for jobs have not uh, got jobs uh, you know, uh, in MG and REG. And uh, many have not been able to complete the uh, you know, 100 days. So it, that, that also um, you know, has fallen short. So uh, that is definitely uh, a need for uh, you know, creative job creation, uh, new ways of looking at employment. And I think uh, uh, very, uh, very, uh, very good insights Sandeep has uh, mentioned, and that is that to look at employment from the women's perspective. Uh, uh, I think that is something that uh, we need to uh, probably think of. And uh, uh, I think with these uh, thoughts, I would like to uh, thank all the speakers and uh, Impri for this opportunity. And I hand over back to uh, Arjun uh, for the concluding remarks. Thank you, thank you so much. <clears throat> and we extended, thank you everyone. And on behalf of 
in pre impact and policy research institute indian social institute and counter view we thank all of you for joining this evening to this very special panel discussion on mandrega amidst the pandemic impact and the way forward under our series the state of employment and livelihood employment debate and i would formally like to thank all of our panelists today professor arbi bhagat professor irudya rajan professor aruna roy ma'am dr gurjeet singh sir and our mentor sandeep chajra sir and i would also like to thank uh, our chair for the session father dr denzel fernandez for executing it so well i would also like to thank all of our participants here and also on facebook or those who watch it later by uh, on youtube and others will also come out with event reports for those who and also bring out the, so many important points all the panelists have given especially for the scheme and share with uh, with all the relevant policy people for uh, making impact on very good suggestion all our panelists have given so thank you everyone and we uh, hope that you uh, join our future episodes of the policy talk and employment event thank you have a good evening thank you very much thank you thank you thank you aruna ji thank you thank you prof sabagat thank you thank you gurjit thank you nice evening thank you thank you gurjit to show because you showed yourself i've been able to see how you look now thank you for that <laughs> thank you thank you arjun and thank nice you. meeting you and thank you to be here thank you